Hello, welcome to Talking Cop. It's the women's show. It's me, Chris Brack. Uh, we're finally back. Sorry, it's been a while. I've been very disorganised. And I'm here with my friend, Emma Sanders. How are you doing, Emma? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. Nice to, nice to be back. Nice to, to see you again on the show. I know, we haven't done one for ages, have we? I can't actually remember the last time we did a show. I know, it's a long time ago, isn't it? But... I think it was in the build. It might have been the build-up to probably middle, middle of March. So, but it's a... Uh, we might as well get into it. It's been a fabulous season. You know, for, yeah. for, you know fourth in the... Well, I think I think we were the ever optimist saying all that Max they'll do is fifth. That at a push. Fourth was just um I don't, think got, I don't think anyone would have thought we'd have done that really. Doing the double over four teams is perfect season, really. Yeah, no. I, yeah, it was. I thought it was a, a phenomenal season. Um I remember saying I would have been very happy if Liverpool had finished seventh again, but improved their points tally because I expected the other teams around them to improve, which mm. they have. You look at Tottenham, for example, they've improved. Um, but I don't I don't think I ever saw a possibility where Liverpool would finish fourth. And that's not because I didn't believe in the potential of the squad. I just didn't think it would happen that soon. And actually what the players have been able to do, what the staff have been able to do, and the club as a whole as well, I think is, um, has been phenomenal, really. And they deserve all of the, the credit and the applause that they've, they've had because not only have they overtaken a Manchester United side to finish fourth. They've almost doubled their points tally from last season. Um, I'm going to say that again just to highlight it. They've almost doubled their points tally. Like That is ridiculous. Eight, um, eight, this... eight, 18 points on last year. Yeah. And I think, what, did they get 22 in total last year? Yeah, oh. last year they got 23 in total. This year they got 41. And I think I've looked, I think since the WSL has been a winter league, Liverpool have never had this many points. Actually, I think even when they yeah. won the titles, they didn't get this many points. Yeah, it's the first time that the club has finished in the top four since Matt Beard won the title with them back in 2014. Right. So this is the highest place finish in a decade. Um, yeah, you might be right in terms of the actual points tally, but certainly in terms of positioning, this is the first time in a decade that they finished in the top four. So um, it, it's just a phenomenal achievement. And also even, you know, the gap on Arsenal. So, and and the fact we're talking about a gap on Arsenal, this is how high up they've come. That Arsenal, are, you know, are the next team above them, and it's nine point gap this season. Uh, you know, last season I think it was it was twenty four points between Liverpool and Arsenal. So, um, I think just looking at it, you can see the difference. But I think there is a lot more to it than just the numbers because we've seen the performances have improved. We've seen the consistency has been there all season. Um, they've always had it in their locker to produce some big performances against some of the big teams. We saw that at, and on the opening day against Chelsea last season, but they've done that not just once or twice this season. They've done it like four, five, six times. They beat Manchester United twice in both games, beat Chelsea, beat Arsenal, um, beat Aston Villa, who were obviously fifth last season as well. So, yeah, just some really, really fantastic performances and I, I, I literally I, I couldn't I couldn't be any happier with how the season's gone. Yeah, I mean to put it into context for me, it's obviously when I started going to the games, it was Scott Rogers in charge about a year or so later, pretty much the whole squad left. But you look at that squad and went, that squad missed out on a, on an opportunity to overtake certain clubs when we did. Whereas this year you're going, yes, Man United have performed, Aston Villa were probably surprises of by their levels of what they did and didn't do. But it was nice to see Liverpool going, well, if you're not going to take the opportunity, we will. And they were doing that um, most of the season. And the nice thing to look at is, I wouldn't say that was Liverpool at their max, because you can still look at that season and go, and you could probably go, you're nine points of Arsenal. You could pick out where you could, where you could find those nine points next year. Because there were points dropped where you're going, actually, Liverpool probably should have won. And yeah. what, But the big difference for me was the away form. Because we I've had a look, we've got 21 points away from home this year. More than yeah. we actually got at home this year, which is unusual. Last year, we got five points away from, sorry, not was it eight points away from home. We didn't get a win away from home. They were all draws. You know, so that's kind of the level we've jumped is we've made ourselves that just hard to beat. Yeah. Yeah, no, we have. And I think I think that's a that's a really good point about the, like the away form. Because I think, you know, Prenton Park was seen as this, as this fortress, if you like, and I know, I I know 100% from speaking to managers, um, you know, the likes of Emma Hayes, you know, formerly now of Chelsea, but 
she always would say that she hated going to Brenton Park. It was a really difficult place to go. Um, yeah, I know. Well. Put in. Hit it well, but she didn't like it though. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think like just in general, there was this feeling that it was you know Liverpool at home were were a tough team to beat, but maybe away from home, they didn't have that same kind of fear factor. I think they have that everywhere now. Everywhere they go, they've got that fear factor because they've got that stability in the side. They've got that defensive resoluteness. Um, the new signings, which I'm sure we'll come on to, have made a significant impact. Um, and they've just smashed it out of the park with the with the recruitment yet again, I think, because, you know, you look, this is not just an, an accumulation of one season. This is a accumulation of three years since, you know, Beardy came back into the club in 2021. Everything has been geared towards getting into the top four. Um, the move to Melwood, all of the signings, um, this idea of signing younger players that they could develop to play a style that he wanted to play and to like, you know, sort of push them through and build them through mixed with experience. It's just all been the perfect mix. And I think that all came to fruition this season. And um, you're right in that I think there's still potential for the team to be to be even better going forward. So, yeah, a, a, a really interesting summer, I would say. It is, because we, we've done well with the squad depth, the squad rotation, because like last year, we still had some pretty awful injuries. That, you know, Taylor Hines was missing big periods. Unfortunately, Leon Keenan had another injury hit season for her but we've always found ways of getting around it but i think for us to push on to the next level is we probably need to have that level of player but with the better availability records i think that's what tells us that for the back line is you yeah. look at the back line ever still is available most weeks grace fisk don't think missed a game bonner missed one jenna clark mm -hmm. was fit all season you know so that covers a knee far he picked up a calf injury you know, and I thought, and then to be fair, I thought Lucy Parry when she came in, very good, did, did, did what you want to do. The only, the only one you ever have about Lucy Parry is is probably a height for like back post headers, but actually mm -hmm. on the ball as a defender, there's no problems. And she again is that versatile fullback who could play both sides. And then you had squad players who stepped up. Yarda Daniels, Jazz Matthews came in and did jobs. You know, Jazz Matthews did really well at left back when we lost Taylor Hines, which is unusual seeing a centre back as a wing back, but she did the job we needed to. But let's talk about the signs because I'll be honest, the the engine rule, the spine of the, of the team, which is Grace Fisk and Jenna Clark, which comes there first. But we'll talk about the person who I said, oh, she might get a game, and you told me I need to watch a bit more women's football, which was Hobbinger, Marie Hobbinger, who is unreal. Yeah. You know, you know, if people haven't seen her play, you know, she's got goals, she's got hat trick and assists, um, she takes corners and free kicks with either foot. Both the same level of delivery, yeah. and she's twenty-two. Yeah, yeah, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculously brilliant. And you're just looking at how where someone like a Missy Bo Kearns, you're going, she doesn't start. Why? Because she can't get past her. Yeah, and that's a sign of quality. Now, as Missy Bo Kearns has to look at squad role. Yeah, I think I think Mary Hobinger. I remember. Yeah, I I said this to you. Um, you know, at the start of the season, that I I hadn't seen loads of her. You know, I. I'd I'd seen flashes, but it was more what people were saying about her. There was a lot of excitement, and I know there was a lot of clubs sniffing around her. So um, that in itself, I think, whenever there's high interest in a player, you know that they're probably the real deal, or they've certainly got the potential to be that. And she's just hit the ground running, actually. And I think for me, that's been the most exciting thing is that I thought she would maybe take six months, but she came in and and yeah. I, I mean, I think people forget that you know Missy Bokerns is. You know, she's not she's not a full international, you know, she's just, you know, an England youth international. So I think you see the difference in quality, actually, when you then bring in, um, you know, full international midfielders who are just, as uh, you know, they're, they're just quite comfortably a step above. And Fuka Nagano obviously came in, fantastic player last season. Um, we've, got, we've got to see her for a full season this year. Um, then you've obviously got Kerry Holland, who's a full international as well with Wales and, She's been, you know, the the base point of that midfield and such a crucial player for, for the last couple of years now for Liverpool. But Marie Hoban Hoban does come in and she's added that star quality, that stardust that I think we haven't had in midfield. Um, Nagano showed signs of it, but she wasn't maybe the type of player that could take the game by the scruff of its neck and change it. Hoban does can do that. Um, obviously, her set pieces, like you mentioned, is such a massive weapon. Um 
I think it was Philip Smallwood, who's obviously a friend of friend of the show, who's yeah. um, she mentioned the other day on another podcast that as she said, I think Chelsea had conceded two goals from set pieces all season. Um, Liverpool scored three against them in one game um, before, um, obviously, you know, smashing that record apart. So you saw yeah. Emma, you saw Emma Hayes' reaction. She just you could see her mouth it. Yeah. The set piece. She yeah. just like you could just see her set, as soon as we scored the winner. With the service, she just sat down. She's like, yeah. what, "What can you do?" Because a lot of their set pieces, you can't say it's bad defended. They're just undefendable. Yeah, and um, also I think I think you have to mention Sophie Roman Hogg in this as well, who was obviously mm-hmm. the marquee signing in the summer. Um, broke the transfer record to bring her in. She obviously started the season injured and then took a bit of time to grow in. But I think the last six months we've seen exactly what she can do for this team. And you know, she may not be, um, you know one of the best strikers in the league but she's certainly one of the best strikers that Liverpool could have for this team and what I mean by that is that she fits in perfectly with the players around her so her holder play is fantastic she's obviously incredible in the air and when you mix that together and you put in the set piece qualities that we got with Marie Hovinger and you've got someone who can head the ball and who can move in the box um, and has that intelligence that Sophie Roman Hogg does. I think it's just such a good recipe um, for success. But I remember speaking to Mark Skinner at Manchester United um, before uh, the penultimate game of the season, which obviously Liverpool won one nil via a set piece. Um, and I said to him, "Have you been practicing these set pieces?" And he, you know, he was like, "Yeah, yeah, we've been practicing." Blah 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 blah. Um, still couldn't do anything to stop him. So uh, yeah, I think I think Hovinger has had a a huge, huge impact. Yeah, I mean, you've got to give the manager credit because he's much maligned at times, Matt Beard. Uh, you know, a lot don't like the five at the back. And I think we felt at times last year, five, two, three didn't quite work in WSL. Felt that like we always got overrun. But this tweak where we've gone to more of a, a five, three, two works for the players got because it allows Sophie to do the hold up play and have a runner offer, which is normally. Lawley, Van der Sanden, or Mia Enderby at the end, or Leon Keenan. But because of the dynamic midfield we've got, they know she'll win it. And they're taking the risk to break. I guess, like to Chelsea and Arsenal, it, it's a risk reward because you do get caught. I think yeah. City away, we, we did. And we paid for it where they put five passes. And, you know, that's that's the learning curve you've got to have with this system. But that little tweak, you were like, that's what, that's what we had. That's probably what Kate Stengel didn't have. Which was she was a bit of a batter. She was a ba- used as a battering ram, but it was nothing round her. So it was yeah. doing it on your own. I think there's been a bit more of a team. The, the team structure seems to have helped a bit more. But talk about the other signings. Uh, we've got to talk about it. Grace Fisk and Jenna Clark. I mean, it got to yeah. the point that Nifar he would get injured, and you weren't in the slightest bit worried because you you had these coming in. But let's talk about Grace Fisk. I mean, she's playing left side of centre back. She's playing right back. She's just ridiculous and yet somehow still can't get an England squad and I think I heard you say in another podcast we're happy to have her I'm surprised there are, there are clubs higher up the table that weren't looking at yeah no for like for me it's like I could spend an hour talking about Grace Fisk player of the season easily for me there's not even a question about it I know people will say Hoban just had a massive impact and and, oh, and they're right I've, I've got enough one as well we'll come to that one yeah, um, yeah, I know who yours is, but for me, there's just there's not even an argument. Like Grace Fisk has just been um, incredible because she's, you know, you mentioned that availability. You know, she's not just been available, but she's been available right. and been been brilliant every single week. Um, I I literally can't think of a poor game. I I, I can't think of a poor game no. from her at all. Um, this is someone who'd been at West Ham for uh, four or five years, so to then come to a new club. Um, and I, you know, I did a piece on her uh, before the Merseyside derby, and the thing that everyone said was, it feels like she's been here for about ten years, and I think that sums it up quite well. Actually, the way she organises, she leads, the responsibility she takes on, um, the way she sees the game, the connections she has with her teammates, um, that just clicked from the first from the first game. And then when you match that with her obvious individual quality anyway, she's obviously a very good defender. Um, I think it's just been fantastic. And, yeah, you mentioned England there. I I, I can't believe she's not in that England squad. Um, she's she, also very yeah. underrated on the ball. 
Very yeah, I, I, yeah, I think she's one of the best ball playing centre backs in the league. Um, she's the best I think Liverpool have had for, uh, I don't know, for as long as I, I don't think I've seen a better ball playing centre back play for Liverpool women. Um, and I've been following them since maybe 20, 2014, 2015. So, um, yeah, I think I think she's fantastic, and she obviously gives that versatility that we know Matt Beard likes to have in the back line. And when we're talking about the systems and the formations. I think it for me it was less so about I didn't think the back five worked. It was more I think you need a very specific sort of I don't know prototype of personnel to fit that system in terms of you need the right midfielders, you need the right strikers who can hold the ball up, and you need the right defenders who are happy to to you know be ball playing and, and break the lines. And I think Grace Fist does that, and obviously Jenna Clark does that as well. Um, maybe not to the the same extremely high standards that Grace Fist has, has done, but certainly um, a very, very good standard. And, you know, Jenna Clark's still a young player. So I'm absolutely delighted with both of them. And I think, you know, two of them are two of the most shrewd signings of the of the summer. I think the nice thing about Jenna Clark is for a young player, she started off brilliantly and she did have a dip middle of middle of the season. She came out the side for a little bit, but then came yeah. again and then you know, gets the big goal against Man United and has a big performance, yeah. which I always think that tells you more about a player, which is when they have the difficult moments is how do they react to it? Do, do they hide? Do the heads go down and that's them done? Or do they go again? And to be fair to mm -hmm. her, even when she's having a tough time, she was always wanting the ball, always demanding the ball, even when it wasn't going for it, it wasn't going for a, for a few games, didn't hide from it. That's kind of what you want because yeah. it kind of shows you, you know, we all have, all players can have bad form, it's how you handle it. And she handles that perfectly. And you want that competition as well. And I think that's something yeah. that we haven't had is that, you know, we, we could probably have named the start in two centre-backs for like the last five years. I think mm. now, you know, there's, if, if, you know, if Matt Beard named a team sheet that had Grace Fisk and Jenna Clark on and Gemma Bonner was on the bench, for example, with Nee Fahey, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really bat an eyelid if it was Gemma starting alongside Jenna, like I wouldn't bat an eyelid. I think, you know, there's there's very very good centre backs in in the squad now, and I think we haven't had that sort of array of options for for a long time. Yeah, and in terms of the other sides that came in, we had uh, Flint who came in um, for the first six months season, then uh, left for Celtic. It sort of felt like the right time for her her to move on because she just wasn't going to get the game time once everyone was fit. Mia Enderby, I think it's been a big learning curve. I mean, she's only she 18 you know yeah. the pace of her and we saw the goal she scored in the Conte Cup against City we know what she's got I think it's a matter of putting it all together but at 18 you're going to have to accept you have these um, flashes of brilliance and these flashes of frustration I think what was nice was because we were so comfortable in the league near the end we were able to give her a run of a couple of games and to be fair to her they weren't like gimmies they were like right we need you to start against Man United we need you to start against Leicester to get the wins to get us to guarantee top four you know, so it was a different. It was a different type of pressure. It wasn't like a we need the goals to stay up. It was a we need the goals to push out of the league. And then the probably one of the pitch I think's probably still got maybe some questions around is the goalkeeping area. You know, Rachel Laws has been a great servant, but she's not getting any younger. You know, she is starting to pick up a few injuries. And Tegan Micah, I think we've seen both sides of her. You know, we've seen some brilliance. You know, the the late saves against Chelsea, but then we also saw the City away game where it it, it just be honest, epic for most of the team it fell apart against Man City, which you know you can have that. But I'll be intrigued to see what we do with goalkeeper next year. Do we stick with the two we've got, or will they be on the lookout for another bit of competition? I'm I'm not worried about the goalkeeping situation to be honest, Chris. Um, yeah, like I t yeah, I take your point on Tegan Micah. Um, I I personally I I I think she's had a good season. Um, I think we forget that she's was massively hit with injuries at the start and I think it took her a while to get going so she was in and out um we've got Faye Kirby still to come back obviously from a serious injury and she was you know putting some massive performances the young goalkeeper just before um so I, you know I think I think in terms of you know the future of the of the goalkeeping positions I'd, I'd be very very happy with Faye Kirby and Tegan Micah and you like you say I think when Rachel Laws' contract comes comes to an end then that would feel like an obvious time to mm. to maybe bring someone new in, but um, yeah, personally, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be looking at goalkeepers in in this window. 
unless there was one that was available now that they felt they might not be able to get in the same position next season. Like an opportunistic one, basically. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I don't, I, know. That, I don't know who that person is, but, you know, I don't know, a contract situation, you're going like, didn't see that coming. That's an opportunity yeah. to improve. But otherwise, we're happy where we are. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy. I, I think Tegan Micah is generally a very, very good goalkeeper. I can't wait to see her have a full pre-season and have a fit start to the season. I, 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 I think she's a wonderful goalkeeper and I think I think Liverpool will, will be fine. Cool. Cool. So the other, the other two people we're going to talk about is one is obviously you know who I think's player of the season is, and everyone, I think everyone knows I'm in charge of talking cops Twitter when it's uh, the women's games, and I've credited it. I keep saying it, it is the living legend that is Gemma Bonner. Yeah. You know, second stint at the club, and it's just un- unreal. Whenever she plays, she's so consistent. She's a goal threat, and I think she's perfect for this team, which is still very young. And listen, you know, Gemma's got plenty of years left. I know she's not in the twilight of her career, but she is that perfect leader they need. And it, it's just great watching her play. You know, she's broke the record appearance now for the club. You know, yeah. so I think, she, again, she's been had a fabulous season and has been pretty lucky not to get too many injuries, apart from the horror one at Man United, which yeah. I still haven't quite got my head around how the referee just only gave a free kick for it, but we'll, we'll yeah. move on from officiating. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, she's she's been brilliant. I think Lauren Black from the RNTV Women's Podcast said the other day that Gemma Bonn is Liverpool's greatest player, and I don't disagree with that. I think she is. Um, and I, I do think she has had a, a fantastic season. I think for me, you know, the fact that she's been able to play so well alongside Grace Fisk, and I know, you know, we were saying that there's been options at the back, but for me this season, it, it, like they, they have been the best two centre-back pairings. Um, is, you know, Gemma Bonner and Grace Fist together. And I think they just work so well. You know, Gemma's obviously got that threat from set pieces as well. And um, she puts her body on the line because she genuinely absolutely loves the club. And I think when you've got somebody like that in the changing room who, bearing in mind, she's played at some massive clubs as well. She's won silverware. Um, she's won silverware at Liverpool under, under obviously, Matt Beard. The, the two WSL titles was captain at the, at the time. So... When you've got somebody like that in the squad pushing you day in, day out, and you know, it's just so used to having such high standards, I think that only helps everyone. And I think when Matt came back to the club, it was the Gemma Bonners that he wanted around and that he sort of molded the team around because he knew he needed a strong base of people that were going to work hard every single game, that were going to be reliable, that had the experience, that had the leadership, that were willing to take on the responsibility of what it means to play for Liverpool. And um, yeah, I, th- I think Gemma does that exceptionally well. And yeah, she's had another great year. And I think there's still, still, like you say, several, several more seasons to come from her. So a fantastic player for Liverpool. Yeah, and I've, I've no doubt she'll be the next female ambassador at, at Liverpool once when yeah. she does decide to retire. You know, 100%. she'll be her and Tash Dowie. You know, will, will be a great duo, which people can look forward to seeing. Yeah. Uh, but the only the person who does need a big shout out is the manager. Who's yeah. just been named manager of the season, you know, yeah. so, and you know he's just every year he's took he's took the club on to a next level. Got that championship first go when he when he took over, tweaked the style, and as a whole with him at the at the helm with the club, the recruit the recruitment side of it is just you can see the evolution the evolution that he's going for each time, which is why, and we will come to departure because there was a at least one that was a, a shock. But I think Wilkes is now like, it's a shock, but then we're all going, I can't wait to see who he's got lined up to replace them, though, because you're now like, long gone are the days of eight, eight years ago, Emma, where, you, where you used to go like, honestly, God, I have no idea who's going, what's coming in, this this is going to be anything. Whereas now you're more like, I'm excited to know who's coming in. So it's all, you know, it's it's just like, I can't wait to see what the evolution's going to be. And that's kind of the culture he's created now. Yeah, and you know when he came in three years ago, he he had a very clear five year plan, and that was to get promoted back to the WSL, uh, consolidate their position in the WSL, and to reframe and restructure everything around the club that they needed to be able to then push on for the long term. So by that he meant the move to Melwood, bringing in more members of staff that had expertise in other areas. I think they've you know they've added at least two three members of staff since. 
um, since maybe 18 months ago, you know, new analysts, new nutritionists, things like that. Um, this has obviously been changes to the board with director Russ Fraser coming in two years ago, I think it was, um, might be three years ago now, but around the same time as Matt Beard coming in, all of these changes, which Matt obviously led and sort of demanded in a way. And, you know, uh, I'm sure he said this publicly, but if he hasn't, that you know, the the Melwood thing for him was was the number one when he came back to take the job. That was on his on his priority list, and he said to the club, "I'll come back, but you need to give me this." And they did. Um, and like you say, the recruitment has been such a key role as well. And I think what he's done all along is he's always brought in players that he thinks can do it now, and we've seen that develop. You look at the starting eleven now to what it was three years ago, and it has evolved. It has improved. Um, he's added depth in there. So there's, you know, a bit of experience with players who, you know, you mentioned someone like Tash Flint before. Um, yes, it's not necessarily worked, but I don't think the plan was for her to come in and, you know, necessarily be playing games. It was to come in and provide a bit more depth, a bit more competition and, you know, have someone around in training. Um, and then you've got the young players, like the Mere Enderbees, who... He sees for the future, for the long term plan, and and the Lucy Parrys, and you look at the you know the improvements that they've made under him, it's, Lucy Parry in particular, incredible. And you still got like Hannah Silcox to come back, who had yeah. a good yeah. loan at Black, Blackburn, and you know who looked good when she got a few appearances last year. And then we saw Young Shaw make a debut in the last game of the season when she sixteen. Yeah. She just got back just come back from a I think she came back from quite a serious injury as well didn't she? So, yeah yeah so and it wasn't like it was give her a few minutes it was like 15 20 minutes play the play DM which you know we all know is a hard it's a hard position it's a lot of hard yards there so yeah. it's also nice but it's nice to see a youngster getting thrown in because it's an opportunity to get them not because of literally we've got nobody we've got we've got loads of injuries we'll have to throw a load of kids in and just see what happens you know it's yeah. It's the right culture now of throwing kids in, which is it's opportunity, but not in a desperation. It's more of a we've got the opportunity to make you, you know, build up to this level. Yeah, Beardy's never been afraid to use the youth as well. And I think that's the other thing. And I was speaking to somebody earlier about this, actually. I think why people enjoy playing under him and why young players enjoy playing under him is that he's just honest and he says it how it is. And if you're not good enough at that moment in time, he will tell you you're not good enough at the moment. You've got to improve. If you are, then you know he's not going to say, "Oh, you're only 16." We're going to. He's just going to say, "Go on, then. Pro yeah. pro prove what you can do. Show me what you can do." And he's never held back with that. And I think that sort of level of boldness, but also just genu genuineness, I think is is really crucial to to the way that he manages manages the the squad and the development of the squad. Yeah, I mean, if we talk about we've touched on Melwood. We talk about sort of the infrastructure that's changed in at Liverpool. I mean, I I was very fortunate to actually see Melwood when it got reopened, yeah. uh, and it's unreal as a facility, you know. And you can, you know, just watching them up close training. It's really, I mean, to be honest, watching people do rondons is just hilarious. I've mm -hmm. never seen anyone look so casual but do effort at pace. It's unreal. But first year in Melwood, and we post the highest points total. You know, there's a correlation there of. That, that environment breeds success, but it also breeds an expectation now. And I think this is this will be the new thing for Liverpool to get used to next year. Is there will be a fan expectation next year of fourth's great, but how are you going to take us on again? Because that has to mm. be the way. They, I mean, listen, I've no doubt that's how Matt Beard thinks anyway, because yeah. I think he's driven that way. But it's nice to be talking about Liverpool where it, it's almost pushing expectations every time is... Yeah, that's great, but we want to go again. We want to go again, you know. And we've seen this now with this will be the last year we've we finished out Prince of Park from next year. We're going to be playing at St. Helens, which I know you love the name of because you've got the totally wicked stadium, which I know you just can't wait to put that on your byline. Yeah, <laughs> already. Yeah, <laughs> but but it's nice though because um, now listen, St. Helens is further out of Liverpool, and I, I think as from the show Neil Atkinson said, you know that is a risk because it's it's not as close for people to get to. But it's a 10-year lease. It's a more modern stadium. My gut feeling is that's also in case VAR ever comes in because it's a rugby stadium. It's got technology for that sort of stuff. Red yeah. seats is always a, always a perk. But I, I think the design of a stadium suits the crowd experience. But the fact it's a 10-year lease and they're going to have their own changing rooms and outside the tail end of the rugby season, 
it's pretty much their stadium to do what they want. Yeah. That's quite a big show of we're taking it seriously because this is your it's almost like this is your stadium, which will probably help for like fixture lists, especially when we have these delightful clashes with the men's side. You probably can now be able to move the fixtures timed within our system so we can sort of fans can do both games if they want to. So you're stopping people from having to make a choice. Yeah, and for me that was that was a big thing. You know, like that if you've pointed out there's obviously improvements in terms of the fan experience, the branding, um, the commercial aspects and things like that. But for me it was that significant detail of knowing that for a large chunk of the season, Liverpool women will have basically sole control of that stadium. They can pick and choose when they play there. You know, let's say they wanted to have a training session there, I don't know, on a Thursday night. Like, I'm not saying they would, but that, like, there's no reason why they can't. But at the moment when, you know, they're, they're combining that with Prenton Park and obviously Tramway Rovers sort of run the show, um, it, you know, that's not been the case. They've not had that level of flexibility. They have to fit around other timetables and other schedules. They won't have that for the, to the same extent at the, the Totally Wicked Stadium because it's totally wicked. So... Yeah, I, I think it's such a good move and it follows on from the Melwood move, which was all designed around, obviously there was high level resources and facilities there, but also this idea that this is your training facility, this is your space to do what you want to do with it. Um, go and design your calendar, go and design your cal- your, your diary and do what you want. They can kind of do that a little bit with, with St. Helens as well. So I, I personally think it's a very positive move. You could also hear it from the players because a lot of the player interviews, uh, I saw a couple of you done as it's also about this will push our levels, this will push our performance. Mm-hmm. What's really much to talk about what it will do for Liverpool commercially? Because listen, I'm sure we'll come on to that. There will be things it will do for Liverpool commercially because, you know, that side of the football has to be looked at. But it's more about on the pitch. This is going to yeah. make us better on the pitch. And if you're better on the pitch, you attract more fans naturally. Winning just attracts more people. That's kind of what mm-hmm. you want. I think for the fan experience, um, I mean, politely, as much as Tramway was great for us facilities wise, it wasn't the best, you yeah. know. So that if you have, if you didn't have the delights of going to the toilet at Tramway, look at you, it was not the best. Uh, but also, just that I think it's a bigger area around us. If they want to do the fan zone thing, there is a bit more space to be a bit more creative than just being a kick around and a pelt shootout, you know. If you because yeah. that's what we have at the men's game. But like you were saying, Emma, about picking your thing. Even things with the fans, you could do a bit more. Like you could actually say, "Let's do an open training session." Why? Well, we can. That yeah. could be a thank you to the fans here. End season, nice. season goals. Here's an open training session. Again, getting the the, the team and the fans even closer. You know, because you know, the bond with the fans and the club is probably the best it's been in years. You know, because yeah. the fans love the play, love the players anyway. We like what we're seeing on the pitch and the play, and you can see how the players react to it. So it's becoming that perfect circle of you know positivity feeding positivity which is what we want really yeah the only thing i'm going to miss though is is the clipper clippers yeah we did we yeah. have we have had, we've had fun at the clipper haven't we yeah I've had, that, I've had like yeah, yeah philip philip smaller says that there's there's a couple of pubs nearby and there's there's the tgis no that no there's not there's a frankie and benny's so all yeah. oh, right is that, still, is that still going that's exactly what i said <laughs> but apparently oh, okay. Oh, we'll have, to, we'll have to test them out. See which, yeah. which one's going to be the new home then for us. Yeah, yeah. We need a new, we need a new clipper. That is the one thing when we're talking about fan experience. Maybe for us adults, we are losing a a big a big fan experience there. Yeah. Well, we, to, we must be, we've, had, we've had some laps in there pre and post match of games. Yeah. I've found a lot of a lot of match reports. Well, not match reports. A lot of quotes pieces in that pub. Yeah, I know. I've seen them. <laughs> uh, so, in terms of like squad for next year, then. So, in terms of who's left the club, um, Mary Taylor uh, left at the end of the contract, which probably wasn't a big surprise because she went out loan in January for more game time. So, it sort of makes sense that she would probably look for somewhere where she's going to get more game time for her. Uh, she needs to find the Sandon. End of the contract. It feels at the right time. She's just been a very unfortunate injury just to caught up with her. And from a personal perspective, you know, she's recently had a daughter. So, you know, it yeah. might be cl- somewhere close to home, spend more time with her daughter. You know, they all kind of feel, both of them felt to me quite obvious moves that, that probably suited club and players. Um, Lawley, I can see the deb- there's a 50-50. Because in my head, Mel Lawley, I was like, if you're in a position where Mel Lawley is your squad option, 
you're not in a bad you're not in a bad state of things. But from her perspective, maybe she wants to play more regularly, you know, and she's been a fabulous servant to, to Liverpool. So, you know, she will be missed. But the one that's probably caught a few people off guard is Emma Covisto, as in the club decided not to extend her contract and she's been when fit the main right back for the last two years has been really good for Liverpool. You know, I, I jokingly yeah. christened like the infinite of women's footballs and you just know what you're going to get. Seven out of ten, she's really good in attack. She's a very good defender and she will chip in with the odd goal. I think that's, you know, what, from what I've seen from people I speak to and the social side of it is that's the one that's caught everyone off guard. I was like, oh, if you'd have said to me one was leaving, that wouldn't have been a defender I'd have picked. Yeah, I was disappointed by that. I I, I think I've been quite vocal about um, Emma Corviso since she signed. I remember when we signed her, she was the one I was most looking forward to seeing. Um, I rated her very highly from her time at Brighton. Um, she's just so consistent. I think she's like the James Milner of the women's side where you just know yeah. that you're going to get a seven to eight performance from her every week. Um, I think there are limitations to kind of what she can do in that maybe attacking win back role. And I think maybe that has played a part into the decision. Um, I think there was maybe the factor of she'll be 30 soon and maybe they're thinking for the long-term option. Um, obviously, there is already Lucy Parry, who's maybe the young one coming through. But I think there are um, those types of factors that I think Liverpool are now thinking about because, you know, gone are the times where they sign players on one, two-year deals. It's, you know, it's it's three, four-year deals now. Um, I think that's, that's the hope is that you get people in on these long-term contracts. So, Maybe that's played a part, but I, I, I personally, I like, I, I would have kept her, um, a hundred percent would have kept Emma Corbisto. I think she's been one of the best players of the last, last two years. So, um, yeah, I was disappointed by that. The other three, I wasn't surprised at all. Um, I understand your point about Mel Lawley, but I think when you, when you're looking to take this club forward, if you want to be a top three team, um, then you know, in the forward areas in particular. Um, I think you need four or five forwards that are at that level that are fit consistently. Um, and I think, you know, it just felt like, it, you know, the right time for all parties, I think, with with, with that one. And obviously, it's, just the, you know, the same case with with Shanice. And obviously, M Miri, you know, when I mentioned before about one of those signings that I think, you know, Matt had as, as maybe this period where we're growing and he wanted that squad depth, I think Miri was that perfect option for somebody who provided the depth when Liverpool needed it at the time. And then when they had players back that were fit um, and she sort of moved down the pecking order, she obviously went out on loan to Aston Villa and she's done well there. So, um, you know, I think I think both Aston Villa and Miri will be looking to to sign a permanent deal there. But I, I think it, a lot of it makes sense, apart from Emma Corvisto's departure, which, yeah, I don't I don't quite understand. But you know, look, if they go out and buy a... A new, a new right back who's an upgrade, then then you can see why. Well, that's what I'm saying. With Liverpool's hit record so far with transfers, you are thinking like, well, if, if they are bringing the Liverpool right back in and it's better than Emma Coy Visto, we'll all be sat there going, that's some fullback you're getting then. So there, yeah. there is that element of excitement. Obviously, I think we'll all be anxious till we see who that person is. You know, that's the thing to look, to look into. I, I think just looking at squad evolution overall, I still feel probably goals is still a thing we probably need to be a bit more have a bit more threat with there's, there's, there've been games where we've won this year and look you'll take the wins but you have looked at something like the Leicester 2-1 win or the Bristol City 1-0 win where you've gone there's been opportunities in those games where you probably should have been further ahead and the benefit of getting further ahead then is rest legs rotate players reduce injury risk because you because you're comfortable and that's where the likes of Man City, Arsenal, Chelsea are elite is when they have the opportunity to put the foot in the throat, they really do. They rack up the goals and that's when you see them like take it off like a Eve Charles with half an hour to go to give her, give her a breather because they're 4-0 up and they go, we don't need to worry about it now. We'll, we'll rotate the players that need a bit of a rest. Whereas we probably have been able to do that as much because the games have probably been a little bit more tighter than we would like. So I sort of feel like that seems to be the next evolution of the squad who those players are you put well you'll know that definitely know better than me yeah no i i agree i do think for me it's not necessarily bringing in a forward it's bringing in a number nine specifically because i think we've had a lot of sort of wingers and and for wide forwards over the last couple of seasons 
And we've only really had two outright number nines, and that's Katie Stengel, who, who obviously was successful, and now Sophie Roman Hag, who has been successful. Um, but I think when you're always playing with just one number nine and there's no competition really for that player, um, you're not going to have the same uh, squad impact that the teams in the top three have. Like, you know, you look at the likes of Manchester City, probably the, the exception in, in that they've got obviously Khadija Shaw. And then after that, they haven't got the same level of depth, but they do have Mary Fowler, who's an exceptional mm-hmm. Australian international. You've got Lauren Hemp, who's played number nine for England. Um, yeah. You know who can play in that role? Chloe Kelly, who was a number nine at Everton and and was their top goal scorer there before signing for City. So, you know they've got very good options who can play the number nine. And then you look at Chelsea, and I know that they've had a lot of injuries this season, but their squad you've got the likes of Sam Kerr, Katarina Macario, um, Myra Ramirez, British you know transfer record. This like they're huge, huge players. And Liverpool, they've got one number nine, so. For me, that is the next step. And it's to get Sophie somebody who she can play off. Because I think obviously she has played with Leanne Kernan in, in that position in that position. But for me, Kernan, like she's a wide forward. She's a pacey yeah. right. Like, you want her in that wide areas for me. So um obviously, you know, there's there's room to to move in and cut inside. But yeah, I'd 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 want a I'd want a number nine and I think one that can guarantee you ten goals. If you've got two number nines who can score ten goals a season each. Um, I think that's a significant, significant help. Yeah, because even if you look at Tottenham, we finished um, a couple of places below us. They have Beth, Beth England, um, Martin Martin. Thomas. Yeah, you know, and sometimes they play both, or sometimes they play one. But yeah. he, but that because they were the ones I was always worried about when we played Tottenham. It was like, oh, we kept them quiet. Oh, they're bringing Beth England on. You'd be like, Oof, that's yeah, that's quite that's quite that's quite a scary prospect. Where I'm listening, Liverpool handled them well, but that's. That's the sort of thing you'd like to have. I mean, listen, you're not going to get Beth England out of Tottenham because she's top candidate, but, you know, sort of that ilk coming in, you'd be like, OK, that's... Also, it yeah. takes the pressure off Roman Hag if she gets a whack or gets a knock, we can actually yeah. rotate her out and it, you don't look and go, oh, we're a bit... We look a bit light now, so... Mm-hmm. But, yeah. That and and you say and you say you can't get someone like a Beth England, but... We had her alone, didn't we? So, but she, maybe she yeah, will now because top four. But as in Tottenham paid a quarter of a million to get her in from Chelsea. And I don't think anyone saw that happening at the time. So there's no true. reason why Liverpool can't get in a striker of that quality um, this transfer window. Yeah. So in terms of expectations for next season, is anyone you're looking forward to seeing how they improve, how they, you know, developed? Um, what do I'm starting to... I thought we started to see develop, I think it was unlucky with their knee injury was Sophie Lungard. I felt before any injury, uh, I'm careful of phrases because I don't want it to come across the wrong way, is she looks physically more dominant than she ever looks at. She look, Basically, she looks like yeah. someone who's hit a gym for six months. Yeah. Because when they put her in the DM, um, probably tail end last season, she just looked physically bigger, stronger, and because technically she's very, very good on the ball, but she always looks a little bit lightweight. And I do wonder if that's when they're grooming to be a more defensive midfielder who can play the ball. Yeah. Uh, but I'm intrigued to see because I thought she got to a point where she was almost making Missy Bow fifth choice, which is credit to her because that's how well she was playing. She was becoming who am I bring off the fence? It was always going to bring Sophie off first before I bring on Bow. Yeah. Which you wouldn't have said six, six, seven months early. Missy, if she wasn't staff, would always be the first sub because she'd be a creative spark. So that's someone who I'm, I'm thinking. I mean, to see how she develops, assuming, you know, everything goes well with the knee injury, which all sounds like it's going fine, luckily. Yeah, no, I've, I, I think you're right. Like, I think, yeah, for me, definitely, she is above Missy Bowen in the pecking order. And, um, yeah, I, I, I think she's got a great ceiling. There's a lot of excitement around her. And I think, like you say, we saw that. I was at the um, the Aston Villa game and thought she put in a really, really strong performance in in, in that game in particular. There was a couple of others that stand up off the top of my head. I can't, I can't think who who they were against, but that one I remember. Um, yeah, I know we spoke about her already, but Jenna Clark is another one. I'm excited to yeah. see her her development next season. Um, I know she had like a few niggly injuries here and there this season. I know she played through a lot of it, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see how how she gets on. Um, and it'd be, you know, nice, now... it'd be nice if Kieran and get a seventy eighty percent season yeah. injury free. It'd be nice because. You saw when she came on against Leicester. 
that's the Keenan we saw in the Championship. Yeah. It was just yeah. pace and scared the life out of defence and clinical. We just haven't seen enough her. And it's not her fault. You know, when you come back from such a horrible ankle injury, it was a horror ankle injury she got yeah. two years ago. You know, it takes time to come back from it. And unfortunately, you always tend to pick up nickels and you come back from a long-term injury. But you're hoping clean bill of health this summer, we can see her, her get a run. Because again, we've seen with all these sides, pace is a killer. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, she like she was the other one I was going to mention, to be honest, because yeah, I think I think we've seen in flashes, like you say, she's kind of back to her old self and she mm. she is a brilliant player. And you know, she was she she was Liverpool's best player the season that they won the that they won the championship two years ago. So um I think the way that Liverpool play now, the players that are around her in that midfield area, I think Kernan can have such a massive impact. So yeah, I'm excited to see how she progresses next season and alongside Mia Enderby as well, another obviously young attacking player. So I think we've got we've got some really interesting prospects that we saw this season in particular, glimpses. But, but I think next season and going forward, I think, yeah, I think we can see what they're all really about. Yeah, so it, it's looking good. I suppose the one improvement we probably would also like to see around Lip as a whole is if we're being honest, the cup runs were disappointing, especially the FA Cup. The FA Cup yeah. felt like a real opportunity. And sadly, I was at the Leicester game. And I, listen, fair play to Leicester. They, they had their way of playing and they were well worth the 2 0 win. Liverpool didn't do, create or do anything in that game. But you yeah. were looking going, that side, home, that felt a bit of a home banker. And then you've got a Tottenham game, which you would have been a 50 50 because Tottenham are top away is difficult. But just felt that's the only thing this season where you're looking going, it's feel a bit like an opportunity missing in the FA Cup. More more than the Conte Cup. Conte Cup could be a little bit one yeah. thing you're kind of done. It's 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 a tough competition to get out of the group stage. But the FA Cup, you were like I felt like there was probably something left on the table there a little bit, unfortunately. Yeah, hundred percent. I was at the Leicester game as well. And yeah, I, I thought that was the most disappointing game of the entire season because yeah, there's no reason why Liverpool couldn't have gone on to reach the final and even won it because the side who won it, Manchester United, Liverpool beat twice in the league this season. Um, you know, so they, they were more than capable of beating Manchester United. Obviously, Tottenham, it was their first ever um, FA Cup final. But, you know, they needed extra time to get through Leicester. I think Liverpool were, are capable of beating both teams. So, yeah, definitely disappointing. And I think, you know, you mentioned the Conte Cup. I think the problem is with the setup and the layout of the Conte Cup, Liverpool are always going to be in a group with Manchester United and Manchester City, you know, and most of the other time Everton as well. Um, they tend to be in the five team group because it's it's the North West as well. Um, mm. They've found themselves and, in that it, difficult group. It's, and you know, you, and you know, next year Man United will go quite strong in the Conte Cup because they will have Europe. Yeah, yeah so exactly. I, actually, it makes the Conte Cup even more difficult because yeah. they're not going to. Man United got one less competition to rotate it. Yeah, exactly. So I think like I think Liverpool, I think Matt Beard has been quite vocal about this without out, outright saying it. The Conte Cup is not a priority because the you know there's there's not much point in throwing all of the resources in there in a setup which you know is not designed for Liverpool really to be successful in. But the FA Cup is a different matter. And mm. yeah, I think I think everyone was very disappointed to lose that that home game as well against Leicester City, who were playing a few days after their manager had just been sacked, you know. Um, so. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll come to that, because it's been... Um, we'll talk about the WSL as a whole for a bit. We'll talk more about your your area of expertise, journalism, because there's been some big and interesting stories that have broken through. Yeah. One was the Leicester manager, um, which has brought into question um, player and coach um, relationships, you know, how that, how that is how that is in a women's game, how it, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, which in the Leicester manager's case was inappropriate. And then we had sort of the ongoing investigation into ACLs, which unfortunately just seems to be, it feels like every three weeks there's a new player that's got one. Well, it's becoming like, it's a horror injury anyway, it's a horrible injury to get, but it, it, I know there's more research being done into it to find out why it seems so much more susceptible in the women's game. But then I saw some pieces you've done. Uh, one was with Frank Kirby, which was talking about uh, body image and how yeah. social media and body image, you know, is seen in the women's game. And was a very brave interview done by Millie Bright, talking about uh, the mental health side of, you know, how how it deals with when you've got like a long term injury and how it can really can affect your mental health. So it's been 
which are, a lot of what bigger things are being come, coming to light in the women's game, which is what you want. These sort of you, know, you do have to build up these serious stories, which probably weren't getting highlighted as much five, ten years ago. But it's been on off the pitch, there's been quite a lot going on in, in women's football. Yeah, I'm exhausted. It has been a really mentally challenging season. Like I'm like sort of I was half joking there, but I, I I'm being genuine as well. Like I think it's been really, really challenging from all aspects. Um I think, you know, I'll start off firstly with the Frank Kirby and the Millie Bright stuff. That's something that, um, you know, I've I've always tried to do a couple of pieces like that throughout the year where, you know, big pieces. I did another major project this year that I'd been working on for about eight months on motherhood in the WSL as well. And it's, you know, those types of stuff I'm quite passionate about doing. But um, I think that's a sign of the development of the journalism industry that there's now more members of staff for example that bbc have to write about women's football which means i can now spend a little bit more time focusing on some of the more you know bigger discussions some of those projects that do take time so things like the mini bright interview um and you know the frank kirby stuff and i can take you know days out of my week to go down and you know travel down to london and interview them in person and have conversations off record and you know you know get get to grips with of what they want to you know talk about and really do my research for those things so you know it's not just a sit down that takes two hours there's a lot of work that goes into this stuff so i think that is a sign of the growing development of the industry that there's now more stories like this obviously not just from myself from all of the other national journalists in particular that now have the ability and both the backing from the editors to be able to write things like this so i think that's just a well done to kind of everyone who's allowed those stuff to be produced um and the support that you know we get from our workplaces and then obviously to the players themselves who have the bravery to speak out and are now aware of their platforms and are willing to use them so you know frank kirby and millie bright are two of the most incredible women that you know i've met within the sport and you know they're always very willing to, to chat about issues that they think can you know resonate with others and help others and um yeah i thought they both spoke fantastically well and i was just honoured really that they allowed me the platform really to to show what what they had to say um in terms of the player coach relationship stuff um yeah I think you know I actually did a again one of my projects three years ago was actually on player coach relationships in the WSL and I think I remember speaking to you about this Chris um maybe at, 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 at the time but I was passionate about it then and you know I did a lot of research and a lot of conversations I, I spoke to off record I spoke to I think it was 23 um managers coaches members of staff or players within the game um on their views on it and compiled a you know a, a 3,000 word sort of project piece on it and you know kind of nothing has changed since then so I've, I've found it really exhausting and really sad actually that we're still having this discussion three years on and I think more needs to be done by the authorities. I think more needs to be done by clubs themselves. And I think coaches um, need to understand that the game has moved on now to a professional era where there's a lot more at stake for players. You know, the livelihoods are at stake from decisions that are that are made. Um, there is a lot more of a power imbalance now. And I think the game as a whole is still learning. And um, I'd like I'd like them to learn a bit quicker. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, going away from those sort of subjects, but we said the game is developing. You know, there is more now games on television. You know, uh, Sky and BBC are pushing a lot for it. You've still got the FA player when it works <laughs> to watch games on, which is always a frustration. But um, the probably still, I still feel infrastructure wise, not just Liverpool. But obviously, I can talk about Liverpool because I've, I've experienced it. Getting tickets is still. In terms of away tickets and allocate, you know, away allocations are getting better, but it's still, if it's still a bit, it still feels a bit lastminute.com, a bit, yeah. bit startupish. You know, that's kind of the point you get as a fan sometimes, or, you know, you can't get on the bus because it's booked up, but then you find out nobody's on the bus. You know, but yeah. I, I'm worried about it to happen a little bit. I, I know it's happened at the Tottenham and a few other clubs, you know, so it, it's just trying to find those little ways around it. And, as much as people have complained about it, I think people need to get in the real world is the price of women's football is going to go up. I mean, you look at the Chelsea game, 
and Arsenal games. There were sellout. There were sellouts at the Etihad and Stamford Bridge. These weren't free tickets and twenty quid tickets. These were 35, 40 quid tickets, like what you pay for the men's game, because that's what you're paying for now. It's not on. I think we've got away from the women's game being a novelty. It's elite sport, yeah. and I think, I think that's why probably the, the away derby at Goodison was a bit disappointed with the crowd because it wasn't free tickets. You had to pay, and listen, it wasn't expensive. It was like twenty quid. It wasn't. Yeah. We're not talking big money, but that's where sometimes there is that little bit of a disappointment. It's like. Also, some people don't want to pay for it. You're like, well, it's elite sport. I'm not really sure what, what more you want from it. Yeah. Well, I think I think we're just in that in-between period, aren't we, where, yeah, like you say, people that have been in the game for a while, it's maybe a bit a big transition for them to then start paying, you know, prices that they're not used to paying. But I, I 100% agree. For me, it is, you, you're paying for what, for the quality and for the work that these players and staff produce. You know, they... If, if you want if you want your club to go out, out and buy, you know, a quarter of a million striker like Bethany England, like what Tottenham did, That's then you, you've got to pay for them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and I know people will say, oh, you know, that kind of money is, is you know, the, the wages of for one week of what, is someone on the men's side. And I understand that. But at it's the end of the day, it is all proportionate. And also you want to grow the women's team sustainably as well. You know, you don't want to just borrow some money from the men's side. Like that's that's what what's the long term plan with that? If you just borrow in, it's like borrowing money from a bank. Like it doesn't work like that. You need to run that business. You need to build that business organically. And so, and we've seen other clubs when the men's side are struggling. Where does the money get shelved from yeah. first? It gets shelved yeah. on the women's side. Whereas if the more self sustaining, that's not really an issue. It's kind of off the books. If you know what I mean. I know officially. The separate accounts, but we've we've seen enough examples in football when a men's team is struggling, the women's funding gets cut. Which we've seen, yeah. It. We, yeah, know, yeah. We, know, we know we know it goes on, so we can't pretend it doesn't. No matter how much public publicly it will be denied, it, it's normally pretty obvious on on the pitch what happens. Yeah. So that, that's kind of a thing people I think are going to have to get used to. You know, I'm fully expecting Liverpool season tickets to go up this summer because they pushed they pushed the top four, they pushed to a new state push for a new stadium it's just got to push on because what you're getting now is you know you get what you pay for and we are getting much higher quality than we were getting five six years ago yeah five six years ago you couldn't get away with charging more for Liverpool because we weren't seeing it structurally being pushed whereas now you know to be fair to Billy Hogan I sat in a the women supporters club first introduction and he was the first exec I'd heard talk about Liverpool and his first words were well, we want to win, and I've yeah. never heard an executive in Liverpool ever say that. It's always yeah. just like, Yeah, we want to have a team, or we want to do well. It was never, We want to win. And to be fair, he said it again at the Melwood piece, We're here to yeah. win. That's what you want, that's the mentality we want. It's nice to hear, actually. It's quite a nice, refreshing change where we're actually got, you know, we're going to you may have sat here going, Oh, we're in nine points of Arsenal, probably should have been closer. It's nice to be in that situation where you're disappointed having your best seasons and finishing 10 years, and you're still going. Could have done better, you know. That's how that's how good this team's been. It's quite a, it's quite a nice way to be. Yeah, hundred percent. And and that's that's through the whole club. You know, that comes from all of the directors. It comes from Susan Black. It comes from Ross Fraser. Yeah. It comes from Matt Beard. It comes from Gemma Bonner. It comes from Lucy Parry, who's come through the academy. And you're right, like that wasn't the case a couple of years ago. It was, you know, we've got a women's team that, you know, have played a bit of football, won some titles in the past, and everything was looking back. It was like, oh, this is a, you know, the women's team that. Mm won two titles five six seven years ago and then it suddenly turns into to 10 years and you go in where, where have those 10 years gone and i think liverpool like they don't want to be the yes yesterday's team they want to be today's team and i think that yeah. is that's the big difference yeah so I mean, let's talk about the what the wider context of the WSL there so in terms of the title race you know it went to the last game of the season chelsea won it on goal difference so you know but that top three still a bit of a runaway and, you know, I don't know what you have to do to cut that gap. Probably the disappointment, if you're looking from the outside looking in, is the gap between the WSL and the Championship just feels like it's getting bigger. You know, Paul Bristol finished on six points. It can't have been much fun being a Bristol fan. But what we've seen that the last couple of years coming up, it's just been... not Most teams have struggled. And it's it's been like getting... If you're looking 12 points, that keeps you up. I, I feel like that's always a bit of a challenge. And I don't know... But I don't know what you could do to improve that. Or you know, bring that close that gap. But it's quite difficult. 
Yeah, I mean, it's 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 the, the 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 toughest question I think you know in the WSL at the moment is how to break into that top three, and I think the 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 fine margins, and I know I'm going to sound like a cliche manager here, but the fine margins between sort of the the top five and the top four, and then the top four and the top three, um, it is such a big jump in terms of that consistency. So I think that for me was the most pleasing thing about Liverpool this season was that it didn't feel like it was just they'd had like a period where they kind of got four or five results in a row and it, you know, we saw them jump up the table consistently all season. They were showing that level of performance. They were, they, they played like a top four side all season. And I think for me, that is the key to get into that, that top three, that next step is add a bit more stardust quality. I think, you know, we've already discussed things like, you know, you need squad depth, you need, you need goal scorers who can guarantee you 10 to 15 goals at least a season. Um, and then, and then for me, it's it's that consistency, and it's why Arsenal finished third again this year, and why you know they didn't win a title because that squad has got, you know, no excuse why they didn't go on and win the WSL title, and they just weren't consistent enough. And it's so costly in those top three places that I think, yeah, if you want to break into that, that for me is is the key thing. And to be fair, Matt Beard has banged on about it for the last couple of years as well. So. Um, that is the biggest question, how to get into that top three, and hopefully they can find the answer. Cool. Right, well, before we go, uh, you can see it flying along the bottom. Uh, we are st still trying to raise money for our two charity partners, partners, which is Fan Support and Food Banks and the Lighthouse Cafe in Dublin. So links in the description below. Um, just if you can donate, please donate. If you can't donate, just share it in your WhatsApp groups. We're still aiming to get to 10K, and we're going to give 5K to each, each charity. So you know, they do really good work. You know, I've got the men's games and the women's games. We do see the fans supporting food banks, you know, and the lighthouse is a cafe in Dublin, which is gives food and clothing for the homeless. So they're both excellent charities. So if you can give to these, please, please, please do. But Emma, thanks very much for joining, joining us. Hopefully the gap between us two in the chat won't be quite as long as last time. But uh, thanks for coming on and we'll speak to you very, very soon. Thanks. See you later, guys.